The Lord be with you. Let us pray. Almighty God, grant that the dark clouds of racial prejudice will soon pass away and the deep fog of misunderstanding be lifted from our fear-drenched communities. And in some not too, distant tomorrow, not too distant tomorrow, may the radiant stars of love and brotherhood shine over our great nation with all their scintillating beauty. Amen. Um, today begins a new series in the Rector's Forum that we're calling Living Expectantly. Living Expectantly. It's going to come in three parts. Uh, today we're going to explore Dr. King's letter from Birmingham City Jail. Next week, Daniel Amsler will lead us in a discussion of the texts that Dr. King most liked to preach. And then on Advent 3, our friends from MIFA, which is an organization that was started in the wake of Dr. King's martyrdom here in Memphis, will be here to tell that story. So we're trying to package this as a three to get us ready for this 50th anniversary year into which we're moving. Uh, by the end of this, we will have our menus out for all of the things that are coming up in the spring, uh, and we have a number of wonderful forums and panels planned as we continue to explore this legacy um, in the beginning of 2018. Um, you should have a copy of Dr. King's letter either on your tables or your chairs. I printed enough so that most could have one, but we might need to share. Uh, we have a few more around if we need it. Um, the letter is 7,000 words, uh, and I was tempted today to read it all together because it takes 45 minutes to an hour to get through the whole thing read aloud. But I've decided that we're going to explore it a little bit. But the reason I printed the whole text is that you will do yourselves a great favor if you go home today and take an hour quietly and read this letter, the whole thing, not just the excerpts. Um, what I did in my preparation was read it to myself aloud, which made it, go, uh, uh, it made it go faster and also helped me hear what Dr. King was doing. That would be a great favor that you would do to yourself. Um, other than the I Have a Dream speech from the March on Washington, the letter from Birmingham Jail is probably the most famous of Dr. King's writings. It was a text that I encountered when I was in seminary, um, and it was really the first of his work that I sat down to read. I'd sort of heard the little clips and quotes from the mountaintop speech and from the March on Washington, but it was the first of his works that I sat down to read, start to finish, and I was absolutely amazed. What I want to do today is introduce you to this letter uh, as though I were introducing you to an old friend. Uh, most of my classes, as you know, have lots of sources and slides and things like that, but today I'm going to let Dr. King speak for, his, for himself, and we're going to work through the letter together. The portions of the handout that are in bold are the portions that we're going to read together today. The, po the portions in plain face type are what you might want to catch up on uh, when you have time on your own. I was convicted by two things in this letter. First of all, I had always been taught that Dr. King was a civil rights leader, sort of a, um, a revolutionary, somebody who was out seeking political change. But at his heart, he was a preacher, and he was a theologian, and his doctorate degree is in theology. And I was encountering this as a seminarian when I was learning theology. And so I was finding myself, you'll see he has lots of um, text references in the manuscript. I was reading those books at the time that I was reading his letter. And I was realizing that many, a couple of the references would have been new stuff when he was writing in 1963. It was cutting edge theology then and has now just become a required reading for everybody in any theological program. So I was convicted by that, that he was having the same training that I was. I was also convicted that Dr. King was not writing in the letter, to Birmingham, letter from Birmingham jail to extremists. He was writing to moderates. He wasn't writing to the people who were out killing people and burning crosses on the lawn. He was writing to the people who were saying, just give us a little more time. You're going to win. We just need a little more time. And as a white Episcopalian in the South... I am convicted that two of the people to whom this letter were addre was addressed were white Episcopalians. Not far-right people, 
saying that segregation now, segregation forever, but those people in the middle saying, just give us some more time. I found that very convicting, and I still find it convicting today. Um, I will confess to you one thing as we begin. <clears throat> I really don't like preaching Christmas and Easter. And this may sound strange, but here's my argument. Those texts are so beautiful and so perfect all on their own. If they don't move you, there is nothing that I'm going to add that's going to make that thing work. Some movie reference or theater reference to illustrate the sermon in some new way. If those shepherds aren't doing it for you, if that angel who says he's not here, he's risen, isn't doing it for you, there's really not a lot that I'm going to add. And I feel much the same way as we head into this text. So uh, come with me as we meet a great, great friend uh, of mine, and I'm just so excited to introduce him to you. First, a timeline. The story of the letter from the Birmingham jail begins on April 2nd, 1963. Dr. King arrives in Birmingham to assist the Reverend Fred Shuttlesworth in an anti-segregation demonstration in Birmingham. On April 3rd, 1963, uh, Bull Connor, the famous uh, Bull Connor in um, Birmingham, denies a permit for the demonstration. On April 4th, demonstrations begin anyway, and people are arrested. A court injunction follows against the demonstrators to say that they have to comply with the orders of the city. Then comes April 12th. April 12th is Good Friday that year. And it becomes the first time that Dr. King violates a court injunction. Up to this point, they had been in complete compliance with all of the orders and things that had been given. But on Good Friday of 1963, King and Shuttlesworth and 48 other people demonstrate in Birmingham, and they are arrested and jailed. That is the impetus to put him in Birmingham City Jail, a permitting dispute with the city. Sorry. <laughs> On April 12th, a letter appears in the Birmingham News. Uh, if you're not sure why people are laughing there, check with somebody after class. Um, On April 12th, Good Friday of that year, a letter appears in the Birmingham News from uh, eight religious leaders in Birmingham. Two of them, as I mentioned, are Episcopalians. One is uh, Bishop Carpenter, the Bishop of Alabama, and one is Bishop Murray, the Bishop Coadjutor of Alabama. Uh, there are also on here Presbyterians, there are Reformed Jews, there is a Baptist, uh, and there are a couple of Methodists. And so it's this mid, it's the, what we call the main line now, these folks who are sort of in the middle who are writing this letter. I'm not going to read the whole text, but I'm going to read a few paragraphs for you. This is on the day that Dr. King was arrested. Since we last wrote, there has been some evidence of increased forbearance and a willingness to face facts in Birmingham. Responsible citizens have undertaken to work on various problems which cause racial friction and unrest. In Birmingham, recent public events have given an indication that we will have an opportunity for a new, constructive, and realistic approach to racial problems. However, we are now confronted by a series of demonstration, demonstrations by some of our Negro citizens, directed and led in part by outsiders. We recognize the natural impatience of people who feel that their hopes are slow in being realized, but we are convinced that these demonstrations are unwise and untimely. I'm skipping a section here. Just as we formerly pointed out that hatred and violence have no sanction in our religious and political traditions, we also point out that such actions as incite to hatred and violence, however technically peaceful those actions may be, have not contributed to the resolution of our local problems. We do not believe that these days of new hope are days when extreme measures are justified in Birmingham. Skipping ahead. We further strongly urge our own Negro community to withdraw support from these demonstrations and to unite locally in working peacefully for a better Birmingham. When rights are consistently denied, 
a cause should be pressed in the courts and in negotiations among local leaders and not in the streets. We appeal to both our white and Negro citizenry to observe the principles of law and order and common sense. Thus appeared in the newspaper, and quite literally, somebody came to uh, Dr. King's jail cell with a copy of the paper and gave it to him, and he started writing. Now remember, he's writing from Birmingham City Jail. He is in jail. He has no access to a library. He has no access to reference material of any kind. He has no access to a tablet. He's writing on toilet rolls and in the margins of newspapers and smuggling them out with the one guy who gets to come and see him while he's in solitary confinement, which is his lawyer. And he's taking them out to his editor on the, out, on the outside whose name is Wyatt... Wyatt Walker, Wyatt Walker. So the attorney is smuggling out scraps of paper to an editor named Wyatt Walker who's on the outside compiling 7,000 words of what I would argue is one of the most important theological texts of the 20th century. That, that's how we got this document. We don't know exactly where it was circulated for the first time, but by June of 1963, the letter's dated April 16th of 63, by June of 63, it's appeared in Liberation Magazine, Christian Century, and The New Leader. So it's all around the country by June. In June of 67, now remember that's before Dr. King is killed, in June of 67, the federal Supreme Court case Walker v. City of Birmingham upholds the conviction of King and Shuttlesworth and the others. Fast forward to March 10, 1969, and Shuttleworth, Shuttlesworth versus City of Birmingham. This is after Dr. King is killed. The high court reverses itself and overturns their convictions. For those of you who are Supreme Court junkies like I am, uh, you'll know that reading the opinions of Justice Potter Stewart is always an amusing experience. Uh, Justice Potter Stewart is known famously for his definition of hardcore pornography. Um, and uh, he said, um, I cannot define hardcore pornography, but I know it when I see it. That appears in the Supreme Court record. And with regard to the case of Shuttlesworth and um, City of Birmingham, Justice Stewart writes, It is true that in affirming the petitioner's conviction in the present case, the Supreme Court of Alabama performed a remarkable job of plastic surgery upon the face of the ordinance. But the members of the commission may not act as censors of what is to be said or displayed in any parade. They did a remarkable job of plastic surgery on the face of the ordinance. But the city may not act as censors of what is said in any parade. So that's our context. That's our situation as we start. Um, I went through this letter and just for myself, broke it into about six sections. The first is the opening paragraph, just sort of establishing what we're up to. Then he starts talking about the situation in Birmingham specifically, and that covers about 25% of the length of the letter. Then he moves into a general commentary on justice, which is about 40% of the letter. Then he talks about the role of the church, another 20% of the letter, and then he comments on the role of the police, a little bit less than 10% of the letter. If you're tracking with me there, his commentary on the situation in Birmingham is only about a quarter of the length of the letter, and I think that's what makes it endure. He answers the specific situation, and then he talks about justice, and then he talks about the role of the church, and he talks about our community. That's why this letter has lasted, and that's why it's worthy of being read by people separated 50 years from that particular incident. I'll also uh, come back in just a moment to uh, uh, the ending of the letter, which uh, was what I used for my prayer at the beginning of the class. Um, 
King uses what I'm going to call a Pauline structure here. So King and Paul get along really well. He reads Paul, he knows Paul, he references Paul in the text. And if you look at the end of the letter, it just kind of sounds like Paul. And we know that of King uh, because I think it was in 56 or 55, um, King had written another document called Paul's Letter to American Christians. I think it was actually a sermon that he gave, but he wrote a letter in the name of Paul to American Christians. So we know this about King and his love for Paul, and then we see this sort of Pauline ending at the end of it in case we needed any more encouragement. Any questions about the sort of structure or background? All right, let's dig in. Um, I don't think that this all needs to be in my voice, so in just a moment I'm going to ask someone if they would read the bolded text. But the first section that we're going to explore is the situation in Birmingham. What's going on? And this is King's direct response to what's going on in Birmingham. And the first argument that he answers to is this suggestion that he's an outsider. So remember that from the first uh, letter? People from outside our community have come into our community and are agitating. We're doing just fine in Birmingham. But outsiders have come in and helped to cause the problem. And that's what King responds to first. May I ask for a volunteer? So I, along with several members of my staff, am here because I was invited here. I am here because I have organizational ties here. But more basically, I am in Birmingham because injustice is here. Just as the prophets of the 8th century B.C. left their villages and carried their, thus saith the Lord, far beyond the boundaries of their hometowns, and just as the Apostle Paul left his village of Tarsus and carried the gospel of Jesus Christ to the far corners of his Greco-Roman world, so am I compelled to carry the gospel of freedom beyond my hometown. Like Paul, I must constantly respond to the Macedonian call for aid. Moreover, I am cognizant of the interrelatedness of all communities and states. I cannot sit idly by in Atlanta and not be concerned about what happens in Birmingham. Injustice anywhere is a threat to justice everywhere. We are caught in an inescapable network of mutuality, tied in a single garment of destiny. Whatever affects one directly affects all indirectly. Never again can we afford to live with the narrow, provincial, outside agitator idea. Anyone who lives inside the United States can never be considered an outsider anywhere within its bounds. What do you make of that? Mm. So Connie just said if she were to post those last few lines on Facebook, it could seem like they were written today. What else do we see in this text? Reference to Paul, yep, his buddy, King and Paul. Mm -hmm. Community, what affects one affects everybody else. Liza? Yes, yes. So Jesus said, if you feed someone, um, give someone food, give someone clothing, to the least of these you do, who are my children, you do it unto me. This idea of interconnectedness. He's not an outsider. This is us. We're Americans. We're Americans. And it doesn't work to be from one part or another. We're all together. Mm -hmm. parallel to the prophets of the Old Testament. He's laying himself a pretty solid framework here. So I'm speaking as the prophets spoke. Now, the prophets were not welcome. Uh, they, these were not heroes who came in. These are people who came in and told you that you're about to lose your kingdom because you've been doing things wrong. That's the prophets, and he's attaching himself to them, and he's attaching himself to Paul, the one who agitated and changed the whole way we understand the faith because it wasn't big enough for Paul. What about that bit that a threat to justice anywhere is a threat to justice everywhere? Important King quote there. Injustice anywhere is a threat to justice everywhere. We don't get to just sort of sit over here and say, well, that's going on over there for King. We're all in it together. So Barbara has called our hearts and minds to what's going on in Syria and the sort of conversation around the world of who has an obligation to help. Um, the same conversation was going on just before World War II. Um, what's going on in Europe? Does it have an impact in North America? What's going on in Japan? Does it have an impact wherever? 
Bill's, Bill is just underscoring that uh, Birmingham is a very biblically based area, big floppy Bibles everywhere that the preacher can use to emphasize his points. Um, b- very biblical area, and, and he's speaking their language. So he's not coming at it saying, oh, well, this is what the Holy Spirit is doing and this and that. He's saying, here's what the Bible says. We're going right back to it. And Bill, I would say to you, he ain't, you ain't seen nothing yet. We're, we got more to come. Ben. Yes, yes, yes. So he's writing in 63. And so the experience of World War II, the Nazis, Bonhoeffer, Niebuhr, all of those people uh, are fresh in their minds. Um, King will cite Reinhold Niebuhr a little bit later, and I'll tell the story then of how he connects with Bonhoeffer. But this idea of theology standing in the face of what's going on in the world is very popular at that time, less than 20 years after the close of World War II. Daniel? Yeah, no pass. It's not a local matter when it comes to justice. It's a humanity matter. Steve, last word. So King is a scholar of history and of the Constitution and is holding in mind that slavery in one part of the country was a problem for the whole country and that we have not been a country that says it's okay for this to happen there and this to happen here. When it comes to these matters, we need to be together. And it was not just in the South. No, no indeed. All right, let's try another section here. Um, The second piece that he addresses in what I'm calling the first section on the situation in Birmingham is about um, what the uh, letter to which he is responding calls unnecessary unrest. Unnecessary unrest. Dr. King responds with a, direction, with a description of what non, nonviolent direct action is and then why it's necessary. Uh, if you will turn to page three of your handout, I did not highlight for you the, um, his uh, four-point description of what nonviolence is, but I'll just make mention of it, uh, that the last point of that is a willingness to accept the consequences. So nonviolent, uh, what King calls nonviolent direct action, what others might call civil disobedience, if it's being done for the purposes of justice, must be done with a willingness to pay the penalty for violating the law because you are saying that the law is unjust. So it's not okay to violate the law and expect no consequence for King. The two go hand in hand. And we're going to get a little bit of that in this uh, section on page three. May I ask for a reader for the page three portion? You are quite right in calling for negotiation. Indeed, this is the very purpose of direct action. Nonviolent direct action seeks to create such a crisis and foster such a tension that a community which has constantly refused to negotiate is forced to confront the issue. It seeks so to dramatize the issue that it can no longer be ignored. Just as Socrates felt that it was necessary to create a tension in the mind so that individuals could rise from the bondage of myths and half-truths to the unfettered realm of creative analysis and objective appraisal, so must we see the need for nonviolent gadflies to create the kind of tension in society that will help men rise from the dark depths of prejudice and racism to the majestic heights of understanding and brotherhood. The purpose of our direct action program is to create, create a situation so crisis packed that it will in- inevitably open the door to negotiation. I therefore concur with you in your call for negotiation. Too long has our beloved Southland been bogged down in a tragic effort to live in monologue rather than dialogue. Lamentably, it is an historical fact that privileged groups seldom give up their privileges voluntarily. Individuals may see the moral light and voluntarily give up their unjust posture But as Reinhold Niebuhr has reminded us, groups tend to be more immoral than individuals. We know through painful experience that freedom is never voluntarily given by the oppressor. It must be demanded by the oppressed. We must come to see with one of our distinguished jurists that justice too long delayed is justice denied. Mike Murphy, who was Reinhold Niebuhr? 
Reinhold Niebuhr was a great theologian, a great activist, and I know that Mike is a student of Niebuhr's, otherwise I wouldn't have called him out like that. <laughs> and the author of the Serenity Prayer, indeed he is. Um, so here's the quick story about what's going on in the 30s in um, Protestant theology. Uh, Karl Barth is a theologian over on the European continent who is part of the resistance movement to the Third Reich. Bart is writing a document called Church Dogmatics, which basically reframes the entire understanding of Christian theology. Over in the United States, Reinhold Niebuhr is a professor at Union Theological Seminary in New York, uh, and one of his students is Dietrich Bonhoeffer. In 1932, Niebuhr publishes a book called Moral Man, Immoral Society, which gives us for the first time the idea that sin might be corporate as well as individual. It's not just the things that I do or don't do, but the things that we do or don't do together as a community. And he observes that people have a tendency to behave more immorally, or to take out the double negative, less morally, when they come together in groups rather than when they are working as individuals. That was a new idea, a brand new idea in 1932. Dietrich Bonhoeffer is sitting in this classroom with this man who has, who has come up with this huge insight, and Karl Barth is over on the continent rewriting Christian theology, participating in what's called the Confessing Church, which is the church that stood against the Third Reich. And Barth writes to Bonhoeffer and says, you got to come home. We need you. And Bonhoeffer leaves the security of a New York classroom and goes back to Germany and ends up losing his life at Flossenburg for participating in a plot to kill Hitler. This is what's going on in theology in the 30s. And this is when Dr. King is uh, probably just approaching graduate school. So he's hearing these things and thinking these things and then starts citing them here from memory in the letter from Birmingham jail saying, this group is behaving immorally. And the individuals within it are saying, well, we're going to see our way out. We're going to find a thing. It's going to be good. It's going to be, we're going to talk. It's going to be great. But as a group, we are continuing to behave immorally. That's the Niebuhr reference in there. What else did you see and notice? Mm -hmm. You're not going to really negotiate, even though you say you want to, unless I create a problem that you have to answer. Did you hear how he described himself, him and his colleagues? Nonviolent gadflies? Ben and I had one of those at the altar this morning. He was flying around the wine and the bread, and like, you know, that sort of thing. You know, a nonviolent gadfly that comes around and gets your attention. Gets your attention. What else did you see in here? Two great quotes, two important, important quotes if you're making notes in the margin. Justice too long delayed is justice denied. Is this where we have the, the wheels of inevitability? No. We know through painful experience that freedom is never voluntarily given by the oppressor. It must be demanded by the oppressed. Freedom is never voluntarily given by the oppressor. It must be demanded by the oppressed. I think what he's challenging us here to think about is to say, are we, are, would we really be willing to give up privilege and power? Probably not. We're not inclined to do that sort of thing. We kind of like privilege and power. But those who do not have privilege and power will need to demand of us that we do before we're going to take action. And I think that's worthy of reflection. Yeah. Yeah, so the, they say he's not negotiating. He says, actually, I am, and then goes to reframe what it means to negotiate. It's brilliant. Brilliant rhetoric. What else on this section? Socratic method, absolutely, and a great reference back to Socrates. So we're about to get a reference to St. Thomas Aquinas coming up, and it's important to remember that the West forgot about the Greeks for a number of centuries, and it was the Muslims that held on to Greek philosophy, and when they came into Europe, reintroduced us to them. And then people like St. Thomas Aquinas pick up these great philosophers and these great ideas and then try to apply it to Christian faith. And that's where we sort of get this modern understanding of uh, systematic theology. But Socrates is here. So he's grounding himself in the ancient Greeks. He's grounding himself in Scripture. He's grounding himself in law. He's grounding himself in modern theology. 
and we're about a third of the way through. <laughs> You're the idiots in the cave looking at shadows and calling it freedom. I'll just let that stand all by itself. <laughs> It is. It is exactly what he would say. So this is the section that I've sort of defined as his response to Birmingham. And we're about to shift gears now and do his discussion of justice. Those of you who were here last week for Stephen Bush's discussion um, about the role of the Public Defender's Office um, heard him refer back to letter from Birmingham jail. Um, I thought that Daniel and I were backwards in the schedule, so I was going to say, oh, I wish I was teaching next week. And here I am. Uh, so we're picking up on it. Um, but he's, what he said was, this is not just sort of a theological essay. This is a commentary on justice. And I would argue that about 40% of the letter is focused on his justice commentary. And we're about to move into that. Um, the next section is a little bit long, um, but I'd love to ask for another reader. And it begins on the bottom of four and then ends at the top of six. We're not reading the whole thing, but just the, the bolded passages. May I have a volunteer to read that section? I'll, I'll come with you, Margaret. Um, what I'm gonna, I'm gonna just preview here what we're getting. The key idea here is that King is going to argue that there is a difference between just laws and unjust laws. And he's gonna go to some length to define what that means. And he's gonna say that we have a moral obligation to obey uh, just laws. And he's going to strongly imply, if not say directly, that we have a duty to disobey unjust laws. Because in the words, as he will say of St. Augustine, it is no law at all. He also goes on to say that the disobedience of the law should be taken very seriously. He's not an anarchist. He's not trying to overthrow the law. He's trying to bring justice into the law. All right, Margaret, I'll bring you the microphone. One may well ask, how can you advocate breaking some laws and obeying others? The answer lies in the fact that there are two types of laws, just and unjust. I would be the first to advocate obeying just laws. One is not only a legal but a moral responsibility to obey just laws. Conversely, one has a moral responsibility to disobey unjust laws. I would agree with St. Augustine that an unjust law is no law at all. Now, what is the difference between the two? How does one determine whether a law is just or unjust? A just law is a man-made code that squares with the moral law or the law of God. An unjust law is a code that is out of harmony with the moral law. To put it in the terms of St. Thomas Aquinas, an unjust law is a human law that is not rooted in eternal law and natural law. Any law that uplifts human personality, excuse me, any law that degrades human personality is unjust. All segregation statues are unjust because segre segregation distorts the soul and damages the personality. It gives the segregator a false sense of superiority and the segregated a false sense of inferiority. Segregation, to use the terminology of the Jewish philosopher Martin Berber, Buber, excuse me, substitutes an I-it relationship for an I-thou relationship and ends up with relegating persons to the status of things. Is that as far as you want me to go? I'm sorry. I'm sorry. Yeah. I hope you are able to see the distinction I am trying to point out. In no sense do I advocate evading or defying the law, as would the rabbit segregationist. That would lead to anarchy. One who breaks an unjust law must do so openly, lovingly, and with a willingness to accept the penalty. I submit that an individual who breaks a law that conscience tells him is unjust and who willingly accepts the penalty of imprisonment in order to arouse the conscience of the community over its injustice is in reality expressing the highest respect for the law. Of course, there is nothing new about this kind of civil disobedience. 
It was evident sublimely in the refusal of Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego to obey the laws of Nebuchadnezzar on the ground that a higher moral law was at stake. It was practiced superbly by the early Christians who were willing to face hunger and the excruciating pain of chopping blocks rather than submit to certain unjust laws of the Roman Empire. To a degree, academic freedom is a reality toward the, toward the cause Socrates, excuse me, I'm sorry. To a, de to a degree, academic freedom is a reality today because Socrates practiced civil disobedience. In our nation, the Boston Tea Party represented a massive act of civil disobedience. We should never forget that everything Adolf Hitler did in Germany was legal and everything the Hungarian freedom fight fighters did in Hungary was illegal. Thank you, Margaret. What's the biblical reference in there? Shadrach, Meshach, Abednego, Book of Daniel, and what were they being asked to do? This is, we're going back to the, st the stories of our childhood here. What were Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego being asked to do? Bow down to a god of gold. It was, to, uh, to the king, to the image of the king, right? Mm -hmm. And Nebuchadnezzar said, into the furnace, make it five times hotter, throw them into the furnace. And then there was a fourth man in the fire, right? God stood with them. Um, it took me until seminary to realize that that was the Old Testament and that wasn't Jesus. <laughs> um, but, uh, but, you know, that's all right. We keep learning. We keep learning and we correct. What else did you catch in there? What's important in there? The purpose of the Constitution, the purpose of law, is to make the union more perfect. And we continue to work towards that. Right. Did I see another hand? I didn't have it in my notes, but given how Dr. King has been using literary and historical allusions, I wouldn't put it past him in any way. Pat, thank you for that. Um, so what Pat's offering us here is this is within 20 years of the end of the Second World War, and he's taking people back to a history that is not far separated from them and reminding them that everything Hitler did was legal and everything the resistance did was illegal. He also points out if you didn't catch this, it sort of ran by. He also points out, I wouldn't argue to break laws. That would make me like the segregationists. Pointing out that the law is already on his side at this point. But not really. I don't advocate breaking laws. That's actually what y'all are doing. Interesting point. Yeah, he's a very persuasive writer. Very, very persuasive. Mm, we will have to repent not only of the hateful actions of the bad people, but of the appalling silence of the good people. And we're going to come back to that in a second. Beth, last word to you. So Beth's question is, where are these critical thinkers today? Uh, and I would say that um, uh, King's friend, St. Paul, asked the same question. Where is the debater of our age? Where is the orator? Um, that each age looks back and says, where are the great thinkers? And what I'm going to offer is that where are the ones from our age? They're right here. They're right here, and needing to insist that people come up to that level. We are a little shy on time, and Dr. King wants to tell us something about time. So who would like to read the next section? I get so taken up in my classes. This, we just need hours and hours. Page 7 in the middle. Can I have a reader? Pat, I saw your hand first. This is... Uh, I had also hoped that the white moderate would reject the myth concerning time in relation to the struggle for freedom. Time itself is neutral. It can be used either destructively or constructively. More and more I feel that people of ill will have used time much more effectively than the people of goodwill. We, have, we will have to repent in this generation not merely for the hateful words and actions of bad people, but for the appalling silence of the good people. Human progress never rolls in on wheels of inevitability. It comes through the tireless efforts of men working to be co-workers with God. And without this hard work, time itself becomes an ally of the forces of social stagnation. Time itself is a neutral. It can be used for good or it can be used for evil. 
how many times do we find ourselves falling into that trap? We're going to get there. Don't worry. We'll make it. You know you're going to win in the end. Just hang on. Just be patient. We're fine. We're going to get there. It'll happen. Progress never rolls in on the wheels of inevitability. Another great King quote. What in this section? What of time? What of the wait, wait, wait? The question for me has always been, is there a comfortable way to change? And I think the answer is no, because it means taking something that at least the general populace says, yeah, it's pretty good, this is working, and going to something that we don't know if it's going to work. We've never lived that way. That's not our reality. And you can see where the fear comes from in that. You know the old joke about how many Episcopalians does it take to change a light bulb? Change! Or... <laughs> Uh, two, one to do the job and one to remind the one who's doing the job that her grandmother gave that light bulb. Or, um, or three, one to do the job and two to, two to say, uh, to discuss how much better the old light bulb was. You know, th those sorts of things. You know, change is not easy. It requires giving something up. It requires loss. And the folks who are the ones who are saying just wait are the ones here whose culture is being changed their whole framework of what it means to be them. They're being asked to set it aside and take on a whole new framework. Oh, and by the way, at the same time, we're going to value judge your old framework. That's tough. I don't want to side with them, but I can at least understand where they're coming from. <laughs> Complac complacency is one of the worst threats that we face. Let's just see what happens is not a historically, uh, not a phrase with historical good precedent. Let's just see what happens. Yes, you have to plan it. Yeah, yeah. If there's not light, there's darkness. If there's not warmth, there's cold. But the best part of that analogy is that light is something and darkness is not. Darkness is defined as the absence of light. Light is not defined as the absence of darkness. Light is a thing. Darkness is the absence of the thing. It's important to remember. All right, the next person who reads gets to read my favorite section of the whole letter. My favorite, favorite, favorite section. And he's responding to the suggestion that he is an extremist. That he is an extremist. This is on page eight. Who would like to read my favorite section? Jillian, I saw your hand first. But though I was initially disappointed at being categorized as an extremist, as I continue to think about the matter, I gradually gained a measure of satisfaction from the label. Was not Jesus an extremist for love? Love your enemies, bless those that curse you, do good to them that hate you, and pray for them which despitefully use you and persecute you. Was not Amos an extremist for justice? Let justice roll down like waters and righteousness like an ever-flowing stream. Was not Paul an extremist for the Christian gospel? I bear in my body the marks of the Lord Jesus. Was not Martin Luther an extremist? Here I stand, I cannot do otherwise, so help me God. And John Bunyan, I will stay in jail to the end of my days before I make a butchery of my conscience. And Abraham Lincoln, this nation cannot survive half slave and half free. And, Jeff and Thomas Jefferson, we hold these truths to be self-evident, that all men are created equal. So quest the question is not whether we will be extremist, but what kind of extremist we will be. Will we be extremist for hate or for love? Will we be extremists for the preservation of injustice or for the extension of justice? The question is not whether we will be an extremist, but what kind of extremist we will be. Uh, I recently went to a conference, um, and a certain city official was there, and a member of our congregation was seeing that city official later and said, oh, did you meet my priest uh, at the conference? And he said, yeah, he strikes me as a real pain in the back end. <laughs> I don't, ha I don't have a problem with that. <laughs> I really don't have a problem with that. You call me an extremist, yes, I'm an extremist, and so are all these other people. And let me give you the list. 
And let me connect myself to all these folks, back to the prophets and to Abraham Lincoln and to the New Testament and to Jesus. Amen. Say amen, somebody. Thank you. Thank you. I'm not, I'm not experienced at getting the amens. It's not my tradition, but that's all right. That's all right. Yes, yes, I'm an extremist. The question isn't whether I'm going to be one, but what kind I'm going to be. Am I going to be an extremist for love or am I going to be an extremist for injustice? Martin Luther King is taking out the middle ground. There's no on the fence. There's no local pass, as Daniel said. We're either on one side or the other. And do you want to be on the side with all these people? Or do you want to be on the side with all these people? Your choice. What else about my favorite passage of the whole letter? Let justice roll like waters, righteousness like an ever-rolling stream. That sort of concludes the section on justice, about that 40% section of the letter. Uh, We are a little shy on time, but here's what I'd like to do, if I may, is quickly just read myself the section on the white church, which starts on page 9. And I'd like us just to hold that in mind, and we'll sort of end there, but I'll commend the rest of the letter for your uh, your good review, uh, particularly the bolded sections that I just uh, planned a little bit too much content for the time we have. So I'm starting to read on page 9 in the middle, and we're going to skip around a lot. Let me take note of my other major disappointment. I have been so greatly disappointed with the white church and its leadership. I must honestly reiterate that I have been disappointed with the church. I do not say this as one of those negative critics who can always find something wrong with the church. I say this as a minister of the gospel who loves the church, who was nurtured in the church's bosom, who has been sustained by its spiritual blessings, and who will remain true to the church as long as the cord of life shall lengthen. I've heard numerous Southern religious leaders admonish their worshipers to comply with a desegregation decision because it is the law, but I have longed to hear white ministers declare, follow this degree because integration is morally right and because the Negro is your brother. In the midst of blatant injustices inflicted upon the Negro, I have watched white churchmen stand on the sideline and mouth pious irrelevancies and sanctimonious trivialities in the midst of a mighty struggle to rid our nation of racial and economic injustice. I have heard many ministers say, those are social issues with which the gospel has no real concern. I'm hearing chuckling. And I have watched many churches commit themselves to a completely otherworldly religion which makes a strange, unbiblical distinction between body and soul, between the sacred and the secular. So here we are, moving to the exit of the 20th century with a religious community so largely adjusted to the status quo, standing as a taillight behind other community agencies rather than as a headlight leading men to higher levels of justice. There was a time when the church was very powerful, in the time when the early Christians rejoiced at being deemed worthy to suffer for what they believed. In these days, the church was not merely a thermometer that recorded the ideas and principles of popular opinion, it was a thermostat that transformed the mores of society. Things are different now. So often the contemporary church is weak, ineffectual, voice with an uncertain sound. So often it is an arch defender of the status quo. Far from being disturbed by the presence of the church, the power structure of the average community is consoled by the church's silent and often even vocal sanction of things as they are. What of the church? Did any or all of the... Oh, I don't know if there was ever a response from those persons... I understand this didn't actually get sent to them directly. Uh, It was published in the newspaper instead. What about the role of the church? Phil? Hmm. Article article in the CA today about the first black basketball player in the NCAA. What Scott offers is that in his view, the church has been co-opted by a secular society, which is a stain on the church. Lauren? Lauren offers that the... So Lauren is turning Niebuhr on his head here, saying, uh, saying that the individuals remain just as bad as we ever were, but we're watching Western civilization make progress over the last 75 years. Now it takes two minutes for this to circle the globe. Daniel, last comment, then I'm going to make a closing remark. 
Thank you, Daniel. Um, here's what I want to say just in parting. I said at the beginning that I find this letter convicting because I'm a white Episcopalian in the South. And I think that we should let Dr. King be convicting. When you read this, don't get defensive. Don't think to yourself why it isn't true of you. Ask yourself if it is. You're just reading it for yourself in your home for your own reflection. Let it challenge you. And when you feel those defensive urges coming, just let them go. You're not going to lose anything by just letting it challenge you a little bit. Um, ben Adams was on my search committee when I came here. Was anybody else in the room on search committee that year? So y'all asked me um, sort of how I felt about politics in the pulpit. And what I said then is what I believe now. Um, I don't believe that Jesus has a position on any particular piece of legislation. And I don't look to Jesus, I don't look to the government to bring about the New Jerusalem, I look to Jesus for it. But I do believe that Jesus has a position on education, on social inequality, on taking care of the least among us, and I think that's fair game. And that's the, that's the place, that's the balance that I draw, not looking to any piece of legislation, any governmental body to be the agent of God, looking to God to be the agent of God, and begging, begging, begging those bodies to please seek his guidance as they do their work. We are going to be imperfect here below, and we get in real trouble when we hand over to politics our moral countenance. That's our work as people of faith. Just a last little parting comment.